Welcome. This is Jack's Tea Party. This is my guest, Larry Merrill. Uh, who I'm Jack Porter. Uh, Larry, you've been uh, with the Michigan Townships Association for a long time now, haven't you? Seems like it, although it also seems just like yesterday. Time flies. Yeah. Well, I, uh, I got into it in uh, 1980. I was elected township supervisor in East Bay. And I, I remember. Was, yeah, we were there for 12 years. You had uh, Jack LaRose was your only other boss, right? And, right. And then, then you came into his position, so there hasn't been a lot of turnover in, in MTA. What, what exactly is the MTA? Well, MTA is a statewide advocacy organization for townships. Almost all local governments, not almost, without qualification. There's an organization that represents cities, one for counties, road commissions, school districts, intermediate school districts, and our role and responsibility are Michigan's 1,240 townships. 1,240 townships. Mm -hmm. And that's um, roughly half the people in Michigan are governed by? Correct. By township government, huh? Right. Okay. And now, a lot of people don't know how this works, but city government and township government are local government, right? Certainly. And county government is like a layer up, right? There's yeah, it uh, tends to be labeled, I think the legislature considers it to be local government. We tend to look at the counties as partners, but they do a, a level of services that tend to be intermediate between the state, and in many ways the counties are an instrumentality of the, of the state government. They run the right. courts, um, social services, health care, uh, a lot of those things they actually do with state oversight. So they do, they have their own jobs under state law, mm -hmm. just like townships and cities. And, and of course, the village is the last thing, and that's kind of a hybrid. That's a, that's a kind of a municipal government laid on top of township. Or underneath it, depending underneath upon the, what your frame of reference might right, be. Right, right, okay. Mm -hmm. uh, so a large part of the land area of uh, Michigan is 96% of the land area is townships. Okay, okay. So it is a very legitimate and well-established form of local government. It's kind of the bedrock here. Yeah, and cost effective too. Uh, and I was a township guy for 12 years. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, at that time, the county was talking about, we need city county government. Townships should be obsolete and maybe they should really eliminate township government. Who was now, saying that? Uh, a lot of county commissioners. Oh, like, like up that. in this area? Yeah, in this area. Yeah. Okay. And, it, and it goes around in cycles, I've seen people say, oh, township government is the problem. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, I never felt that way. Yeah. I have always respected the people who work for townships. And, sure. And I came out uh, of county government. Oh, I, worked, I worked in county government before I came to MTA. And I never heard any, any of my county commissioners ever saying anything but the most respect for the townships. And understand that there are different roles and responsibilities. My county board didn't want to take over the, the functions that, you know, that the boots on the ground things that the townships do. Right, right. Well, right now the county, and, and I, when I was in it, the county did a lot of coordinating through the county DPW. Mm -hmm. And they also took over health department functions and uh, they, they count the dogs, of course. That was the township supervisor's job before the county did it. But mm -hmm. anyway, they, uh, the county is providing services, but it's like each of the townships has a seat on the DPW, and they're all kind of, work, they're working together, but they also want to keep their own township in, in front, if you know what I mean. They're, no, I guess I don't. I'm not sure I do. Well, every time you sign an agreement, there's winners and losers. Is that true? Uh, well, Can't over, you come up with an agreement that uh, is a win-win for everybody? Well, a living agreement. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's what should happen. Mm -hmm. That's what should happen. Uh, but when we negotiated the sewer agreement, uh, the city had one position, the townships had another position, and the urban townships were different than the cities. Uh, we were talking about should we split up the bills by volume or by the number of users or by the growth, and uh, at, then it started raining, and suddenly all the flows into the sewer plant changed, and the city changed their position, the townships changed their position because conditions changed. Mm -hmm. And what's happening is people get locked into contracts based on what the conditions are at this time. And then conditions change, and some people win, some people lose. And then how do you renegotiate the contract on the fly? 
Depends on so, the contract. Yeah, uh -huh. right, right. There's a lot of yeah. contracts. Yeah. And we've got a lot of authorities um, uh, and different ways of working around it. But whenever th something changes, you're in a position of renegotiating and trying to keep your unit of government from losing control mm -hmm. and from losing money. And that, Looking out for your own best interest. Well, right, right. Yeah. And, and being independent. And I think I said before we got on camera that I was very disappointed when the work I did, we built a water main the full length of East Bay Township to serve Acme Township, well, serve East Bay primarily, but mm -hmm. made it possible to serve Acme Township. And then a supervisor that followed me uh, got together with the board and the engineers and, and broke away from that water system. And it created a, a, a fragmented water system. Mm -hmm. And we cooperate on fire, but you know there's fragmentations always coming up when you try to govern and then conditions change and you're locked into contracts. Right. So, so my idea is, uh, at least at the DPW level, to maybe make an authority. Mm -hmm. uh, and there was a lot of talk about that a couple of years ago. And then one of their consultants said, well, you really aren't going to save much money on an authority and you're going to lose local control. So you probably don't want to do it. Mm -hmm. And so they backed away from that. And every time you try to do something together, you bump into this idea of local control. And it was a long time for me to come to this idea of an annexation. But the urban townships surrounding Traverse City are 40,000 people. Traverse City, 18,000 people. Mm -hmm. and. And yet they have a budget and they have a central position that gives that, that 18,000 people has a lot more power than any individual township, even though we may have the same number of people. Or far more. Or, or in our case, more than double. Yeah, if all but, those townships were absorbed into the city, the, those city residents, all of their current status gets diluted by all of these new township voters. Right, and that's... that's yeah, I can understand why they would not be too happy with that the idea. The city... Uh, it used to be they wanted to take over other townships to get more tax base. On the because, margins. Yeah, on the margins, a little piece by piece. Yeah. Uh, we used to call it cherry picking. Mm -hmm, where sure. they would the take tax the, base. They would take the best tax base and leave the less desirable right. and high service areas. Yeah, but, but now since 78, these urban townships, uh, Elmwood, East Bay, and Garfield, being charter townships, they've got a certain amount of annexation protection. It's not as easy for the city to cherry pick like it once was. Right, right. So cherry so pick—that's probably a good term up in this area, isn't it? Yeah, people like that. <laughs> people like that name. Yeah, yeah. Maybe that's where it came from. But anyway, I thought, well, we've tried consolidations throughout the state. The only one that I know of that's been really successful is a Battle Creek township joined the city of Battle Creek. It was successful in terms that um, Kellogg Corporation basically put a gun to the head of the township residents and mm -hmm. said, you either vote for this, give up your local government, or we're going to move our corporation headquarters someplace else. Right. So it passed, not overwhelmingly, but you know they, they had some 4,000 employees there that were potentially faced with you either vote for this annexation or you lose your job. Right. So in turn, so what happened was the, the city had a higher millage rate, the township had a lower millage rate, they blended that so if you were a township resident your taxes went up, city resident your taxes went down. Whether it was successful in terms of doing it, making anything positive, well that's a, that's a hard one to call because you don't know what the history of that community would have been had it stayed the status quo. Yeah, that's so, true. Um, you know, it's still a, a struggling city like most of the urban centers are down mm -hmm. in the southern part of the state. So it, it certainly wasn't a panacea. I guess it's all still a matter of conjecture whether it was successful whether in terms was, of whether, yeah. what it attempted to accomplish. We've got a problem here with the city of Traverse City. Uh, they're in, their expenses continue to go up every year. Their tax base isn't really keeping base, keeping pace. The only way... Now why is that? I see a lot of construction and building. It seems like a vibrant community. Why? It is, is vibrant, uh, but it was accomplished with a DDA, partially. Let's face it, Traverse City beachfront properties, some of the best land in the state. 
Or in the country. Or I, in the country. Absolutely. Yeah, and you really have to screw up badly to make a ghetto out of that situation, right? But, <laughs> but uh, still, they, they feel like they're in a box financially. They, they have zoning that they build the, the buildings higher and higher, so you, uh, you're basically building a wall of, of concrete and steel around that, that bayfront that uh, uh, the people of Traverse City purchased over a 50-year period. And it's an open space, should be available to the public, but as time goes on and more and more condominiums mm -hmm. and expensive stores are built, the people of this region are not going to be using that area as much as the people who move in from outside and buy the expensive properties. A lot of people that grew up here, moved out of Traverse City into the townships, they have no say in what happens in the city. Do they want more of a say? Well, if you look at the complaints, hear people complain mm -hmm. about what the city's doing, yeah, they'd like to have a say, yeah. but I don't think they want to pay the taxes. Right, probably not. So uh, anyway, mm -hmm. my idea is all of this stuff should be talked about. And mm -hmm. if this system of government of five to seven townships surrounding a city, if that isn't the most logical way to organize a community, uh, why don't we change it? Well, why don't well, we well talk when you say about logic... It? Mm -hmm. logical in terms of what toward it, what end. Yeah, you're right. What is your goal? Yeah. Um, I would say having the financial clout to, uh, to hire the professionals you need. Uh, if you have five townships or seven townships, you have five or seven attorneys five or seven planning commissions. Yeah, but the, 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 so the, you've talked about those attorneys. They're not on staff. They're not earning $100,000 a year they're, right. they're all they're paid on a either on a on a retainer basis or they're paid on the amount of work that they do. Right. Yeah. But a lot of the the money that they they earn is reviewing contracts between municipalities and sitting oh. in on negotiations between the municipalities. There's that much going on. We have a lot going on. Uh, here. But isn't that a good thing? I mean to have that much intergovernmental cooperation. Sometimes people think about local government as oh, they're all just balkanized and they don't talk right, to each right. other and they're all little bit of individual fiefdoms. What I'm hearing from you is there's, there's too much collaboration going on. Uh, I don't, I don't mm. say there's too much collaboration. It's, it's a powerlessness. I was in a uh, county commission meeting in 1992 when one of the septic haulers came in and said, we have a problem with the holding tanks. We can't empty the holding tanks in... Uh, in the wintertime. We need a big tank. It's going to cost a million dollars. I could do it myself. I could mm -hmm. borrow the money and put in a tank like that, but it should be at the county level. And so the county started working, and 10 years later, they finally built this uh, septage plant. It grew from a place to take holding tank waste to a place to create uh, Class A solids that you could put on farmers' fields and mm -hmm. stuff. Well, it, it turned into an $8 million project from a $1 million project. And then when they built it, the walls fell down. And, and it was poorly built. Mm -hmm. uh, and what had happened was they had negotiated for 10 years about what are we going to do, how are we going to pay for it. But in the end, they, they didn't do a good job. They got tired of fighting about it. And they said, we got to do something. Our engineers have been with us for a lot of years. Our, our DPW attorney has been with us for a lot of years. Let's just give it to them and go with it. And that's what happened. And it was a poor job. Yeah, but consider, but consider your premise is that if this was all being done by a city of 40,000, none of that would have happened. 55,000. Well, or 55. Yeah. Uh, you know, the notion that a large city turning... Is, is going to be smarter, more efficient, more economical. Is that really reflect reality where? Well, I think that the cost advantage of the township is in the volunteers. You have so many people working for townships that are underpaid or not paid at all as planning and commissioners. And to the taxpayer standpoint, they're saying and there's a problem with that? They're, they're <laughs> saving a lot of money. You're burning up a lot of mm -hmm. volunteer time. People who want to be involved in the community and then they get frustrated. They put in their years or whatever, and they get frustrated, and they go away. 
and they haven't accomplished nearly what they had intended mm -hmm. to do. Uh, so I think you could use that volunteer labor a lot more efficiently in a large community than, than in a small one. Yeah, but larger um, communities have a harder time even attracting volunteers. That sense of community, that sense of ownership, you know, find volunteers in the city of Grand Rapids, the city of Detroit. They don't exist. They all have broken. Instead, they've gone into mm -hmm. the neighborhood. They've, they've turned their back on the municipality for their volunteer efforts, and now they're doing it all at the sub-city level without any real city oversight because, frankly, cities are, the larger communities become so bureaucratically controlled. It's really, it's hard to find a place for volunteers in these larger units of government. Well, that's, that's the problem, isn't it? Yeah. How can you take the best of township government and the advantages of city government and, and put it together so you can save the money, like township government is saving a lot of money, mm -hmm. and, and then city government has got full-time engineering staffs, full-time right. attorneys, and these people have advantages to what they have to offer as well. How can you put those together in a way that the taxpayers can save the money and still have a degree of control over their own government. Yeah, unfortunately, Michigan law at the current stage doesn't really give you that opportunity for a hybrid because there's, there's no opportunity for the city to really disincorporate unless it right. was really within one a township in its, entire, you know, in its entirety. And it wasn't. I mean, it's kind of still carved out of pieces of existing townships. So what would happen, hypothetically, is there's not, it's not an annexation, there'd be a merger. Right. This, all of the townships would merge with the city, and then the city basically becomes the unit of government for, the entire air, for that entire area. And with a city charter, and probably would look very much like, this city, like, Grand, like Traverse City's charter right mm -hmm. now today. Another option would be uh, the urban townships to join into one township. There's ways Could of be. consolidating townships. Could be done. Mm -hmm. uh, and that would reduce the number of variables. See, every time, well, I was a chairman of the beta board for a while, and mm -hmm. what I noticed was the people in the townships had to be represented. They were paying into the beta board, so they had to be represented on the board. But a lot of the worst critics of the beta system, that's the Bay Area Transportation Authority, the worst critics would be... Uh, uh, put on the beta board to try to do something about their concerns. Mm -hmm. So you'd get people sitting on these boards that aren't loyal to the board they're on. They want to discredit maybe the beta system and, you know, maybe pull out of it. Mm -hmm. So they're using their position to not support the organization, but to uh, undermine it. And I saw during union negotiations, we had a board member, I'm not going to use names, but the beta buses were parking in front of the township hall, going in and talking to the one of the ward members that was mm -hmm. coaching them on how to how to fight the management, you know, and things like that. The, the more people you have on these boards have to be represented, the more variables, the more things can go wrong. Well, that's the conflict that has to be resolved. On the one hand, there certainly are things like public transportation that needs to be done on a multi-jurisdictional basis to be efficient and effective. You can't have different bus lines stop at the township city boundaries. So there needs to be a certain degree of cooperation and a recognition that we're all in this together and we have a common cause here. And ironically, uh, for the rest of the state, this area is held up as you know the best example of intergovernmental cooperation, far mm -hmm. right. beyond what the rest of the state has done. Mm -hmm. You're talked about, you're the model up here. And of course, I know you probably see that as a work in progress. But to the extent that these people who are on these various joint boards and commissions start going off in different directions, the question has to be, is it because this body, this, this transportation, the sewer system, whatever it is, is it operating in a way that is consistent with the values and expectations of all of these different communities? And if they can't all agree, then the premise of a regional cooperation does fall apart. So the 
any type of a consolidation such as what you're talking about, Jack, and you know this, that it all has to be approved by the voters individually right. in each unit of government. Right. So if you're a citizen of East Bay or Elmwood or Garfield, or if, if you got ambitious enough, pull in Acme, you'd look at this proposal for a new greater Traverse City and you'd say, first off, well, do we have more in common than we have differences? Mm -hmm. Are the values and expectations of my community consistent with what the general people in this big area are going to be? Am I going to lose influence? Are, is my vision of what my piece of this looks like going to be altered? Will I have suitable voice in it? And then finally, people look at the different millage rates. And the city is levying how many mills? I think they're close to 18. Okay, 18 yeah. mills. How, how many is East Bay levying? Uh, probably between three and four. Or something three, okay, like look at that disparity. Now mm -hmm. we're going to meld this. So why would somebody in East Bay say, gee, I think I'm more than willing to pay 12 or 13 mills, whatever this conglomeration is going to be. Mm -hmm. I'm willing to pay 10 more mills than what I'm paying right now for the sake of having, now I have, what's the population of East Bay? They're around 10,000. Okay, I have one ten thousandth of the, of, the, uh, of the influence here. Now I'm going to have one fifty-six thousandth of, the, right, of right. the influence. I'm going to be a smaller piece of this. That's a hard sell. You're right. You're right. It is a hard mm -hmm. sell. And, and it really is a question of, are you part of the, a greater community or not? Uh, when I go to somewhere, I say I'm from Traverse City. Actually, my mailing address is Traverse City. But uh, Traverse City is the whole area to a mm -hmm. large degree. And, and a lot of people identify themselves as being from Traverse City, but in Traverse City, mm -hmm. They identify themselves as being from Acme or from Peninsula or something like yeah, that. And I, so that's the problem that we have. Yeah. But I think, the, I think the frame, are you part of a greater community or not, is a false dichotomy. You can have it both ways, with tensions and problems and the messiness that you've mm -hmm. acknowledged. Uh, you can have it both ways, that communities where they can see that it makes sense to cooperate, either from a cost-effectiveness standpoint or because we can, be, we, we can serve our communities better, we can be, be more efficient. Communities look for opportunities to do that, but then there, there comes a limit where you say, you know, we're predominantly, we've got a lot of farmland. It does not make sense for the farmers in my township to be city residents. Right. And then you start and you start balancing it. And these suburbs, they don't want to be they don't want to be on water and sewer. They're gonna stay on wells and septic. So we don't need street lights. You know, they mm -hmm. start looking, they start parsing out the services and say, you know, I can get by with what the township is providing. I'm willing to have the township cooperate with, with beta and with certain other things. But there is a way to kind of have your cake and eat it too. But it is messy. And yeah. you have to put up with and understand that it's continuously having to renegotiate these agreements and make concessions and agreements change when circumstances change. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think we've laid out the problem. The solution will not be at this table. Mm -hmm. It'll be the people themselves Absolutely. making those decisions. Well so stated. I know that you are uh, on a tight time schedule, mm -hmm. and I appreciate your coming. My and, pleasure. And helping with. Thank you for uh, Thank advancing you the discussion. Thanks. Yep. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Here's his talk 
Bill Gates, how state budgets are breaking U.S. schools. Now he's not, he's talking about U.S. schools, but uh, quite honestly, uh, how state budgets may be uh, breaking uh, the whole country because state budgets are such a big part of the overall government spending that is state and local governments so that's the inspiration and my uh, my talk is uh, going to be on this subject and I'll take some of slides from uh, Bill Gates I'm, I'm sure he, he won't mind okay this is the first slide that I got from his uh, presentation where he points out the government receipts and spending are getting uh, uh, wider and wider apart. This is the deficit area, and you can see the spending here as projected, uh, and then the revenue is is going down. And he he points out that it's an increasingly difficult picture. Uh, our budget, our economy gross domestic product in 2010 was uh, 14.7 trillion dollars it's a big big number now of that US uh, government spending is 36 percent of the gross domestic product that's 36 percent when you go to the next one you see uh, uh, the revenue, the revenue is only 26 percent. So we see we've got a big gap there uh, between 26 percent and 36 percent, and and it's not sustainable. It's not sustainable. Why have state budgets escaped intense scrutiny until recently? how could you have a problem like this now that's a Bill Gates question and and his answer is that people simply aren't paying attention he says big money little scrutiny let's let's put these numbers in perspective uh, you have the California spending Microsoft spending and Google spending California just one state's budget is 101 billion dollars uh, Microsoft uh, a flagship private corporation is 38 billion dollars and Google is about 19 billion dollars so that just puts the state spending in perspective and the local government is a significant part of that spending let's go back and take a look at the state and local government you see this this part here is the local government spending local so it's a big part of the share of government spending it's a big part of this overall deficit Microsoft and Google combined are 57 billion dollars spending California state budget alone 101 billion dollars so that puts the government spending in perspective electric utility franchising is another perversion of the fragmented government in the region competition for new customers often results in sweetheart deals for new businesses. We'll call the special meeting East Bay Charter Township Board to order for Wednesday, April 21st. If you please join us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Public comment. Anybody would like to address the board, please stand up, give your name and address. And John Porter, my address is uh, 1114 West Front Street, Traverse City. I used to be a resident here 
for 30 years. I was supervisor between 1980 and 92. And I was a director on the Cherryland Electric Board between 1993 and 1999. Uh, I don't think it's a good idea to allow light and power to expand in a tax-exempt status uh, where Cherryland pays property taxes and uh, every dollar that goes into this light and power from East Bay customers is a dollar less that, uh, that Cherryland would have and uh, I think Cherryland covers most of the township so it's really against the interests of the majority of the township to allow this kind of uh, tax exempt expansion uh, but really what's what I think is terrible is that we have two tremendous organizations light and power and Cherryland are both great organizations and have them competing with each other beating each other's brains out and if you look at the people we have here probably make a half a million dollars a year you know and spending their time doing this kind of thing is just uh, tragic. What I think should happen to, to be done with it, you know, you look at all of these problems we have in this community. Take the five urban townships and annex them to the city. Start over. Cherryland should buy out Light and Power, or Light and Power should buy out Cherryland, one or the other, so they're not beating their brains out against each other. Sounds ridiculous, but if you look at what's going on with $8 million expenditure on that septage plant, it is ridiculous. You look at a wood-burning facility going in at the northwest corner of this township, Brown Bridge Pond being drained in the southeast corner of this township, there's no way in Hades would that happen if this was in the city. And that's all I got to say. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Well, I guess I believe it needs to be fair. I believe in fairness and that we need to be on a level playing field just like everybody else says. And uh, it's just unfortunate that we have to be here that an agreement couldn't be reached by the parties here. So. Okay. Okay. Any other questions from the board members? Okay. Then Jim, we're to the point now where we've discussed it. I guess the question is, if the board uh, chooses to go with the franchise ordinance from Traverse City Light and Power, they need to vote on that. If they decide that they want the 411 or what Cherry Land had proposed, the first thing we need to do is pass the hold harmless agreement, is that correct? Yeah, the reimbursement of defense letter agreement. And I, I have immense respect to Mr. Doran when he says on behalf of uh, light power that there'd be no lawsuit to understand cherry land is asking you to take a position that no other township in the state has taken they've offered the letter agreement and i'm telling you is what the duty you owe to your taxpayers um would be to to act on that so uh, if you're going to take that position i am telling you or strongly recommending that that is the first item that you okay so and then what this is referred to as a reimbursement defense letter agreement um it uh, agrees uh, because obviously extra a lot of extra legal time has been put in this that's one of the reasons it's taken so long is you know you're on cutting edge um, ground here in terms of dealing with uh, an issue of this type um, but in any event um, cherry land has agreed to uh, reimburse the township the same amount which light and power has already reimbursed the township which is nine hundred dollars which is a very very tiny step um, toward reimbursing us for the time that I've spent uh, so far. Then it goes on to say that if a lawsuit was ever filed. The franchise, there's no sense even looking at that because it doesn't pertain to what we have within the agreement, correct? I mean, that's a t t light power, but it's my understanding based on what they indicated that the, the um, 
You're not policy was something they considered inappropriate and that they wouldn't be asking for an extension. So I'm not sure it's fair to them to ask ask them to immediately respond. Uh, first of all, I'd thank you for your serious consideration of these matters, but uh, we withdraw the request for, for a franchise extension. Okay. Thank you. Okay. That brings us down to public comment. That's John Porter again. Uh, Hydropower is a good way to go. I'd like to see Cherry Land and Light and Power work together. I don't see that really happening. Uh, but it would be nice, since they both serve this community, they could work together and do that. But really, a bigger issue, what's really heartbreaking is the way all the attorneys and the engineers are just sucking this community dry with technicalities. You got 40,000, and I apologize, Peter, I've known you for 30 years, and you're not like that in person, you know, right? but <laughs> <laughs> you're a nice person. Anyway, uh, the point is, uh, uh, you got 40,000 people in the township surrounding Traverse City. You got 15,000 in Traverse City. This business about light and power, it's a business operated on behalf of 15,000 people. An annexation of the five townships would create a community of 55,000 people. There would be some clout there. You wouldn't have a whole bunch of attorneys all over the region bickering with each other at taxpayer expense. It's really something that should be considered. And a buyout of city light and power could put a lot of cash in the pockets of those 15,000 people. A lot of cash. And that's a separate issue. It might take longer to do. But these are big issues. And when I look at all of the time you spent on your septage plant with an $8 million facility that could have been handled for a million dollars if we were one community, when is the public going to get sick of paying all these taxes and not getting any results or negative results? And I think it's an issue whose time has come and it should be seriously considered. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay, seeing none, if there are no objections, we stand adjourned. Jack, you're not, you're not out to get rid of Vaughn. Don't you? Hi, Jack. Uh, John Porter, I'm former supervisor of East Bay Township, 1980 to 92. I thought I was had five minutes. Is that possible to get a little extra? Uh, let's see where uh, we can go to. Okay, we're all politicians and we live in a democracy. As a demo democracy, it puts a burden on everybody for the government. And uh, I think democracy shouldn't be a uh, spectator sport. Uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger and, and, and Michael Bloomberg think uh, it's worth their time even though they don't need the money. So uh, I really think that we should encourage people to get involved uh, in the community. And I have uh, uh, given you a, an article that I wrote, a letter to the editor. And my question is, if you could design a system of local government in the region, would you go with what you have today, or would you design something different? And uh, if the answer is something different, uh, how can we do that? Why can't we do it? Uh, we, the people, have to have a discussion about what's good about township government, what's good about city government, county government, 
Road Commission, Health Department, and so on. Just list all of the things that are good about it. Can we create something better than we have, taking the good aspects of each of those units of government? Uh, I'd like to see the county initiate uh, discussions of this kind with, with people. And if it were successful to bring five to seven townships together with Traverse City into one unit of government, it would take a big burden off this board. County Commission could get back to the statutory responsibilities that it has, be some relief uh, to the budget. So, um, as costs escalate uh, when you deal with multiple governments, uh, you get bogged down with local rules and regulations. Uh, even if you share a vision with somebody, uh, like on a septic treatment plant, there was a vision. They worked, planned that for 10 years. I was in a county commission meeting and it was discussed in 1992. It was planned for 10 years. And 10 years later, $8 million later, I would submit to you that it's no surprise that we ended up with a system that nobody agrees with. Because nobody had the power to do it right. It's such a fragmented system. The prior system was better before the expenditure. We shouldn't let this lesson go to waste. Uh, it's an expensive lesson and we should learn from it. Uh, I would like to see a system design that's better and give the people a chance to talk about it. The grand vision uh, is talking about all the things that government should be doing. I stood up at the first meeting of the grand vision at the Haggerty Center and I said, what good are all these plans if we don't have a government structure capable of implementing those plans? Uh, one administrator, one board, one attorney. If they don't get the job done, you fire them and get somebody else that gets the job done. You can't blame everybody else for what's wrong. Let's wrap it up here. Okay. I think I'll wrap it up on that point. I'd like to see you initiate conversation on this subject, not confrontational, but just what's the best part of each of these governments and see if there's common ground to put something together. Thank you. Thank you. This brings us to the second opportunity for public comment. Is there anyone wishing to make public comment at this time? Thank you for the second opportunity, John Porter. I did look over my notes and I saw one, one item I didn't say, speak about. <clears throat> this idea of a merger of equals or a consolidation is not my idea. Uh, Pat McCafferty, 30 years ago, brought a speaker from Battle Creek to visit us and uh, uh, he told us about Battle Creek. I wasn't real sympathetic. I was a new township supervisor at the time, so I was a township guy. But I did over the years get used to the idea and, and realize the tremendous savings. Uh, we built a water main from City of Traverse City, a city limit to Acme Township limit. Uh, through East Bay Township, 16-inch transmission main. And that was cut because of the political disagreements. Uh, but the revenue to East Bay Township is 1.1 million a year for that water system. That could be applied to the community's water system. It's a total redundancy of effort. Uh, that's a million a year. That's just one business that we're in. What are your other businesses that could be sharing costs uh, you're talking about hundreds of thousands of dollars savings here in a year in a county budget, but I'm literally talking about millions of dollars. And the savings and the, the ability to serve the community would be great. One of the uh, things that one of our speakers said at the old Regional Planning Commission meeting, we get all the county commissioners, city, township people all together in one room. He was the president of the railroad that served Traverse City, and he stood up and he said, this is going to be short. Let's think about the world that we're leaving to the young people coming up. And if this system that we have now with all the different townships and the city and the county and everybody providing government services that are a duplicate effort, if this isn't the best system that we can give down to the next generations, um, why, why don't we change it? 
how can we justify not changing it? That's my question, and I think you should think about that. Everybody should think about what this guy said. How can we justify not changing it, not doing it? Uh, uh, at least give a try. I happen to live in China right now. I see that government operate. That's pretty efficient. They go into private rooms, decide what's to be done. They come out unanimously every time. And they do it. <laughs> yeah, <right. Unanimously. laughs> and they do it. And it's a tough business model to compete with. And, and if we can do it at the local level, maybe we can do it at the state level, maybe we can do it at the national level. But I believe it needs to be done. It needs to be talked about and see if restructuring will help.